Now, whilst these two homes may look the same, they've been constructed differently, and that can have a direct impact upon the health of the occupants. And I'm going to unpack that a bit more in this video about why that's the case and why it's so important to understand how each of these buildings are built. Now, I'm going to be covering a lot of different areas here. So just so you can jump back on a particular area of interest, at the bottom of your screen, I've just got the sections broken out. Right, let's jump in. It's all to do with the fact that not all houses are born equal. When a house was built is often the best indicator as to how it was built. And by that, I mean the type of construction. And knowing how it was built has a huge impact upon how we need to live in the house, but also how we deal with any issues. Now, this bar chart here shows the different types of construction depending on the age of the build. As the bar chart shows, the vast majority of buildings built before the First World War were built with solid walls. And then it's the interwar years where we see cavity walls becoming much more prevalent. So why does this make a difference to my house, I hear you say? Well, I shall start by showing how the two are constructed, and then you'll see for yourself the challenges that one presents over the other. Specifically, how each of the different types of building manage moisture. And it's about that moisture management that I'm going to cover, and how it affects the indoor air quality. So to set the scene, this next bit is about how relative humidity can tell us where we have a mould risk. So to help understand the relative humidity we have in our homes, these devices are called hygrometers and they're really quite cheap to pick up, which is why I have several scattered around various rooms in my house. But what do we do with that data? Now this graph quite helpfully tells us where the optimum zone or the sweet spot is, where we should be aiming to have our relative humidity in our homes. But it's this area here where I want to focus. When relative humidity levels start increasing above the 70% mark, the risk of fungi and mould growth become ever more present. And here's the issue with that. Inhaling mould spores can cause allergic type reactions, worsening of asthma, respiratory infections, coughs, wheezing, shortness of breath, and living in a cold home can increase the risk of heart disease or cardiac events. And let's for now leave aside the impact on mental health with depression and anxiety. The cost to the NHS is an estimated £1.4 billion annually, treating the illnesses associated with living in cold and damp housing. And actually, when the wider societal costs are considered, such as healthcare, that estimated cost is over £15 billion. And that's bad enough. But when I read tragic stories like this from last year, which drives me for wanting to do something about it to ensure this doesn't happen again. But this isn't about trying to find someone to blame. And I get sick of the reporting from media outlets, hell bent on profiteering from peddling fear and hate that seeks to divide rather than actually trying to work constructively with fixing a problem. Okay, so why is this more of a problem in the UK? Well, one of the challenges is that the UK has the highest proportion of all EU nations with homes dating back to before the Second World War at around 38%. Wales has the oldest housing stock in the UK. So therefore, it might be said that they have the oldest housing stock in Europe. And this presents a significant challenge to both homeowners and our tradespeople that are going to be working on these homes. Because like I said at the very start of this video, not all homes are built the same. And if we treat them as if they are, that's when we start to get these issues. For the next couple of minutes, I'm going to unpack that a bit, but I'm going to focus on those buildings that were built around 100 years ago or earlier, primarily because that's what I've got the most first-hand experience of over the last 20 years, but also because the fundamentals of how those buildings work are still applicable to modern buildings now. So I'm now going to cover the two most commonly occurring different construction types for a brick building a solid brick wall and a cavity brick wall and how they differ with how they manage moisture. So a quick cavity, very obvious cavity gap between the two walls, which will have wall ties to make sure the two skins um, tie together. But the pink point I wanted to raise is that look at the brick bond. In other words, the way the bricks are kind of stuck together. Um, they're all facing the same way. Now these are known as stretchers and I'll come on to the other type in a minute, but they're all in the same pattern. Much like the garden wall I built, See, they're all built in a stretch pattern. And I'll show you now the difference with a solid built wall. So you can see the difference, no cavity, it is a solid brick wall, and the slightly different way it's constructed with stretchers, same way as the cavity wall, and headers, so the end face of the brick. And you can see where those... Now, if you then look at a house, like this solid wall here, can you see I've got shorter bricks, these are the headers, and I've got stretches. Now solid walls are designed to work differently to cavity walls when it comes to our weather. And an analogy I quite like is considering the bricks of your house as a bit like a coat keeping you dry inside. 
where a solid wall is like a thick woolen coat and a cavity wall is more like a raincoat. Now the raincoat is designed to not let any moisture penetrate through, so it runs off the face of the building, whereas a thick woolen coat actually absorbs some of that moisture, some of that rain. Now like with a woolen coat, this isn't really a problem because when it stops raining, the wool starts to dry out and the woolen coat should dry out long before any of that rainwater gets to the inside where your body might start to feel wet. Now this woolen coat analogy is just like our solid brick walls. If the exterior of that brick gets wet from the rainwater and isn't allowed to dry out, the wall will continue to get wet until it's saturated to the point where you start witnessing that moisture through on the internal surface. The difference with a cavity wall is that there's a distinct air gap between the external brick and the inner leaf of brick wall. So that outer leaf of brick can get as wet as it likes and stay as wet as it likes, but there's no damp bridge between that outer leaf and the inner leaf, so the inside stays dry. And it's this fundamental principle about how old buildings function compared to newer buildings. The ability to allow the moisture that it will naturally absorb to evaporate. Now you lot know I love my little DIY home experiments. So I've got myself a couple of bricks, sponges in this case, and I'm soaking them. Then I'm wrapping one of them tightly in cling film to simulate coating it in a non vapor permeable coating like cement render. The other sponge I wrapped up in a load of paper kitchen towel, which is more open cell and vapor permeable, a bit more like a lime render. Now let's leave them in the sun and the wind and see what happens. Now I left these out here for just over a week. I made sure they didn't get rained on, then I unwrapped them. Suffice to say, the cling film wrapped one was still pretty darn wet. The kitchen paper was bone dry. The sponge inside was still wet, but not completely sodden like the other sponge. So when we wrap our porous buildings in these coatings that stop any of that evaporation, this is what happens. Because our old buildings have been designed like this for centuries, and that's why they're still standing today. Unfortunately, general understanding of traditional solid walls has largely disappeared, and builders have tried to apply modern, often incompatible materials and techniques to old structures. For a start, building materials used for historic buildings were very different to the materials used these days. Things like cement renders, along with plastic membranes, waterproof sealants, retrospective damp-proof courses, they all act as barriers to the wall's natural ability to evaporate moisture. And this is when the problem happens. It's a mix of technologies that trap water within permeable materials, and that exacerbates the very problems that they're actually trying to resolve. Traditionally built buildings are actually incredibly simple, providing you maintain this single core assumption that you don't ever try to block the free movement of moisture, then it will never be trapped and will never cause further decay. And the reason these buildings have stood for so long is because they've generally used natural materials that were available at the time. Cement wasn't widely used, there was no such thing as plastic membranes. And the considerations by the architects and designers of our homes from yesteryear were not about moisture blocking, but about moisture management. And the centuries of development that have gone into these buildings have all but been forgotten in favour of our modern technological quick fix material solutions. But here's the bit that comes as the biggest shock to people. It's the same materials and methods used to repair and maintain this building that are actually needed to repair buildings like these. And that's because both of these buildings have something much more in common than buildings like this, despite actually looking pretty similar. Provided you use natural materials, it won't cause any detriment to the fabric of the building or the occupants. But if you try to use the materials and methods used to block moisture, as is the norm on a cavity wall construction, moisture gets trapped within the fabric of the actual building itself. And often the only way for that moisture to evaporate is internally into the inside of the house. And there's two significant problems that happen when this occurs. The first is the physics behind what happens when water is evaporated. It takes energy to change state from being a liquid into a gas. It's the same science behind how our bodies are cooled. The sweat that's produced by our skin takes energy or heat for it to change state from a liquid to a gas and evaporate. That's how it cools the skin. And where that energy comes from is from the heat of the substrate that it's been evaporated from. So effectively, as in our case, it's cooling down the wall as it evaporates the water. So one of the reasons why walls get very cold is because they're transferring their heat energy into evaporating that water. And here comes the second issue with this. That water from the wall has now become water vapour in the air. That increases the humidity in that room. 
So the relative humidity of the room then goes up. And it's these elevated levels of relative humidity combined with the cold walls because of the evaporation create the conditions where mold thrives. Now I've used cement render here just as an example to illustrate how this can happen. And I know when I posted a brief intro to this video on my social medias, the comments blew up with various people talking about cement render. And whilst in subsequent videos, I will go into the specifics about what materials are good to use and what are not so good to use in the various building types. The key that I want people to take away here is that probably over the last 60 or 70 years, we have forgotten how these buildings were built to work. Now, without getting too philosophical about this, my own theory about why our understanding of these buildings has died with the previous generation is because it doesn't make any money. Fixing issues such as damp and mould by adding ventilation or allowing the building to dry out naturally doesn't sell products. There are no building material manufacturers out there ploughing millions into research and marketing to just conclude that we need to use the same materials they were built with. That doesn't make a profit. So for decades we've been duped with this pseudoscience that by applying additional things to our buildings is going to cure the problems that actually shouldn't have been there in the first place. If we consider for a moment our really prized heritage assets, our listed buildings, and let's leave aside whether or not the listed building consent application process and system is correctly funded or fit for purpose. Having their protected status does serve to ensure that any works that are proposed are at least deliberate and would at least consider the long-term implications of any materials used. And there are a number of organisations very well versed and researched into exactly what we need to do to keep these old buildings standing. But what is far less well known, and which I'm aiming to address here in this video, is that exactly the same thought and consideration needs to go into the rest of our housing stock. And by that I mean understanding how it was built, what materials were used, what materials need to be used, how do we stop any moisture from being trapped. And this is one area where building regulations are only just starting to catch up in the last few years. For example, building regulations approved document L for the conservation of fuel and power, was last amended in 2021 and actually came into effect in June last year. This is part of the government's measures to reduce the UK's carbon emissions. But because of the negative impact that using inappropriate methods can have, there are some important exceptions which are detailed in the regulations. This applies to historic and traditional buildings with a vapour permeable construction that both absorbs moisture and readily allows moisture to evaporate. It goes on to give some examples of the types of build, including constructions using lime, render or mortar. So that would mean almost all buildings that were built before the First World War. But crucially, it's this. The energy efficiency of historic and traditional dwellings should be improved only if doing so will not cause long-term deterioration of the building's fabric or fittings. And unfortunately, it's this sentence which is quite often missed by people working on old buildings, including in some cases building control officers. So I know I've covered a huge amount in this video, and by way of conclusion, what I'd like to just look forward to is the future. Those of you that already follow me on my other social medias would have seen I put some shorter videos on various different topics. But my aim for this channel is to actually get a bit deeper underneath the render and actually truly understand the mechanics and mechanisms of what's going on with our buildings so that we can then understand how we need to treat them and what we need to do to keep them efficiently working for the next generation to enjoy. If that sort of thing sounds useful to you, subscribe to the channel, hit the notification bell to be notified when a video uploads. I can't promise that the frequency will be consistent, but what I can do is strive to keep the value consistent. Thanks. Thank you.